know, to look at this thing in its full complexity, that's one of the most important things to bring out. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Solari Report. We are back with Carl von Wolfren. We had a wonderful conversation, but I have to tell you the feedback was marvelous. Everybody wants to hear from you. <laughs> it's great to hear that. Yeah, yeah so uh, I, I don't know. I think between our audience and you, there's a real, you know, uh, I, I, some a real resonation. They want to look at the world in a more complex way. Mm -hmm. So they're looking for people who really understand the world in a much more complex way. Mm -hmm. And they were very, uh, they took to you instantly. So so I have huge demand to get you back on the Solari Report. Well, I, I'm, <laughs> I'm grateful, of course, to you that you've, uh, uh -huh. uh, you have uh, made that happen. Uh-huh. Well, we've been we've been sitting here on the pre-interview, and it's it's hard because you and I think could talk forever. <laughs> anyway, so so and argue forever. <laughs> yeah, but I I think that's part of of discovering of how. Of course. Yeah, of course. yeah, 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 yeah. So so I don't mean to be combative. No, 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 no. I realize that. No, no, no. I uh, I admire you greatly, uh, as you know, and uh, we've had this. Uh, in our first uh, session, too. Yeah. We are a mutual admiration. Having, having done with the mutual admiration segment of this uh, session, uh -huh. well, it's let's see because, what you want to talk about. Because you come at things politically and I come at them financially. You know, so I'm looking at the money right. and you're looking at the political mechanisms and uh, what we're trying to do is look at them together. Right. 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 So we want to talk about, uh, there's sort of four areas I want to talk about today. And the first is... I see the push for control as accelerating. Yes. And there are a couple of critical issues that are very important to understand that you understand. And I want to talk about them because, you know, we, we've watched a period when many of the restrictions that people are dealing with in their day-to-day -day life are, are ramping down. So mm -hmm. they think, oh, you know, it's getting better. Mm -hmm. And it, if you look at what's going on behind the scenes, no, it's getting worse. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk about two, and that is... The WHO Treaty, which mm -hmm. I see as being unbelievably important. Mm -hmm. And then the other is the effort to expand NATO. We just saw the Chinese screaming about <laughs> the conspiracy to expand NATO all the way, you know, are literally way. around yeah. the world. Yeah. 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 So, and, and I've never seen a Chinese foreign minister be as blunt and rude, right. Right. And, which is extraordinary. Right. Anyway, so right. Right. we'll get to that. But let's dive in first. The WHO Treaty. What's happening with the WHO Treaty and why is it so important? Well, the WHO Treaty is at this moment, uh, as it were, the spare point of the next uh, phase in the, uh, in the attempt uh, to take over the world by uh, what you may call Davos, what is often abbreviated as Davos. Uh, we have decided earlier we are dealing with a crime syndicate, right. uh, separate entities, each uh, attempting to accomplish something that they've wanted to accomplish for quite a while, and using the crises that have uh, uh, that have sort of gripped many countries all over the world uh, with this manufactured COVID nineteen. Uh, pathogen that was not real, a real threat, except for the versions, the early versions that came out of the laboratories and that were genetically, that were the, the, with the gain of function that were. Uh, and then <coughs> uh, what has happened is that uh, the idea was that by 2030, in eight years time, uh, it would have had to accomplish its main purpose, the so-called Great Reset, the Agenda 2030. And the Great Reset is about uh, the great final victory of the top of the private sector interests, the very large corporations, the, invest the investment firms like BlackRock and, of course, the central banks, uh, and a, a select group of uh, multi-billionaires, hyper-billionaires, they're richer than multi-millionaires. We can't hardly imagine uh, the, the uh, 
uh, extent of their riches. And <coughs> it will be uh, uh, then start a, uh, a new world in which we are underlings, we are going to be um, enslaved, essentially. That's what the idea is. And yes, uh, I think also there is an accelerated tempo. Now, the WHO is a crucial uh, element in this. As you know, the WHO is today owned, controlled by Bill Gates. He is crucial. He has been crucial all along. He's, the, he's one of the largest funders. Yeah, and he is, but that's not only that. He is uh, through Gavi, it's one of his uh, mm -hmm. institutes, and uh, one of his foundations or whatever, and many countries are involved in this. He has a kind of diplomatic immunity because at the WHO they consider him a member country as a person, but he has, uh, aside from that, he's just essentially the boss. You get this from people who work uh, in the WHO and who have long, uh, you know, seen He's this the syndicate as a representative of the WHO. You would, uh, well, he is, he is a, a member of the syndicate, a very important member. Right. And so uh, the next move is something that will enlarge on the treaty that already existed in 2005, they were signed. Uh, countries had no idea what the result would be, but they uh, signed a treaty that said, in case there is a pandemic, uh, we will have uh, the WHO um, advising and to some, it was unclear whether it was just advising or dictating to uh, the health uh, officials of every country to follow their instructions. Right. Uh, so well, nobody could be against that. We were, you know, uh, the WHO is a reliable uh, UN outfit, and uh, who would uh, think um, what what happened eventually? Of course, was that we had two years of an attempt to, uh, well, to establish a totalitarian system because of these totally insane and completely unnecessary instructions from originally from the WHO, but then later uh, gained their own momentum through instructions through, say, the American uh, health system, Fauci and, uh, and the lot. And of course, the same in, in Europe. At this moment, they are conferring for a new Treaty and that treaty will uh, give the WHO the authority to dictate to all countries policies related to the next pandemic. Right. And the next pandemic could be a health pandemic, but also a um, pandemic following from, from natural events like the, this other crazy thing, the, clim the climate hysteria about uh, the, the human emission of CO2. Uh, and, uh, and they get to define and declare the pandemic. They can, and in actual fact, right. you can put anything under right. these headings. So this is, you will then establish the WHO as the master above the constitutions of all countries that sign. It's the uh, end of, of all the, national sovereignty. Exactly. Right. The only country so far that has publicly said, very openly stated, we are not going to sign anything, is the Russian Federation. And I think other countries are well, leaning that way. Well, you have four countries that are not members of who's? There are, there are four. Well, there's, of course, as North Korea is not, and uh, there are some countries, but they're considered, they're not considered part of a, an important uh, part right. of the... Uh, so uh, this is the next step, and if uh, they sign, I th I'm not sure. I think it's well, two. Th they, I think that two thirds have to sign. So let me ask you: the <clears throat> the first press release that the WHO put out this year said that they were pushing for signatures and a treaty to go into effect in May 2024. That's right. But there's been an indication now, particularly from the Americans, that they think they can jumpstart the process and get it done in 2022, is that correct? Well, you see, we have another thing happening, and that is the new pandemic coming. Yeah, us, and that is avian flu. Right. And already they are killing uh, very large numbers, millions of, uh, right. of feathery uh, creatures in the US. And right. I think it's coming in Europe too. There is already science here and there. Uh, 
right. is the new it's the new misinformation about the threat of a uh, of, a, of another a, virus. I'll put the link up with this. Um, there's a very good documentary by the UK Column on one of the last times they played this game and slaughtered millions yes. of livestock yeah. in Britain. Yeah. Yeah. Using the Imperial College models, yeah. we yes. know how well they work. Right, right, right. right, right. <laughs> so, so they've engineered these kinds of uh, wars on the food supply and, and the livestock and the farmers before. So this is... If this it's a, it down, helps. I mean, the food supply is under threat anyway, right. many, for many reasons. Right. Uh, and also uh, as a result of the uh, sanctions... Uh, 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 on Russia, and uh, there's so many, there's so many things that that, that work together to create a, a food crisis. So, just background on this, not to talk about now, but for many years, you know, well more than a decade, I've argued that the Anglo-American Alliance wants control of the food supply to replace petro. So yeah. to replace, so they've wanted to go from an oil standard to a food to standard, yeah. and if you look at how they engineered both the the um, the Uruguay round of GATT and then yes. Doha, right, right, and right, right. and their big push was going to be through Doha and yep. it failed because yep. India stopped it, yep. and so they keep looking for ways of controlling the food supply, and I think it's very caught up with controlling the currency, so I, they all connected. Uh, you are yeah. better on the financial end of it. Of course, I have also tried to uh, give myself an education on it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now it all it all works together. Uh, right. The question the question always is how much weight do you give every element, every factor in this? Right. And it's easy to go wrong on that. Yes. And there should be, of course, there should be far more. Uh, uh, serious discussion and serious publications on it, but we have a, big, a huge, pr our biggest problem, maybe, if I have to say the single biggest problem is that we do not have the means to talk with each other anymore through published media. I mean, we can't. Uh, we, the, the, uh, the media in Europe are airtight on this, uh, this propaganda bomb that exploded over the uh, the Atlantic right. basin, uh, spreading fallout and uh, radiation so, and, and, and making everybody crazy. And the, the media, with few exceptions, they're 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 so one airtight. of our sections. One of our sections we're going to talk about the disinformation, which is yeah, you're right. This bomb, it is a bomb. Um, who treaty? So many. I I think it's not commonly understood. What's what's in the works to pop out on people through the who and so the question is if you're the average person how do you stop this um the same answer that you would give to people who've asked how do you stop the covid 19 restrictions don't participate right. never wear a mask throw out your uh, qr code from your phone yeah. Don't participate. I'm trying to Just figure out how to it. throw out my smartphone. Yeah, yeah, that's what. Well, I mean, we uh, there's some people who, uh, like me, use the phone only for phoning, right. uh, and uh, but there are also people who are addicted to their phones, and you see this because they're forever. I mean, right. It's it's a <laughs> it's a scene out of 1984 of George Orwell. Right. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that is the answer. Not don't participate. So while the who, it, it's almost as though they went ten different way tracks to control the world. But while the who treaty is being worked on, we also see a move to extend NATO literally yeah. globally. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about what well, okay, NATO is. NATO is is very a very different organization from what it was when it was set up. When it was set up, it was set up as a, only a defensive organization. It would never... Operation Gladio started yeah, no, right no, away. No, wait, wait, no, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, wait a moment. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it's very important to see this. Uh -huh. Operation Gladio came out of something else. And uh, this is another area. But NATO was set up as a defensive organization and would never, ever attack anybody. It started attacking Kosovo. 
uh, the whole uh, well, bulk the, the, the covert operations wait, were, no, let me, let me, were uh, uh, offensive from the beginning. No, no, no. Uh, this is where this is where people do not understand the history of NATO. Okay. NATO became a completely different organization the moment the reasons for its existence disappeared, right. which was with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Right. Right. I mean, NATO had. But they were engineering uh, election rigging and other things from the beginning. No, NATO didn't do that. This was, uh, I think, that NATO was uh, kept to its originally. There may have been, there may have been uh, uh, operations that people didn't know about, and that that perhaps uh, some people in NATO participated in. That I, I think, is quite possible. But it started behaving, of, it started operations that were offensive the moment it, the reasons for its existence had disappeared. Right. There was, there was a time when the reasons for its existence disappeared, when there were genuine discussion in Europe, also in the Netherlands, about uh, should we abolish it right away? Or should we enlarge right. it and turn it into an association for collective security? And then we invite uh, the Russian Federation to participate, and the former uh, countries of the Warsaw Pact. Of course, they were the, the, the vassal yeah. states of the Soviet Union, the satellite countries. And there was a discussion that was taken seriously for, for a bit, but Washington wanted a unipolar world with right. unchallenged hegemony over the entire world. That's after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Right. And you know they were in a position to make that credible, that, that that was possible. And of course, they, I think, they had uh, most of Europe on their side, on the oh. American side for this. But uh, uh, NATO then was used. It was very useful because NATO was, a two, of course, a piggy bank for the military-industrial complex. Exactly. It's only Europeans that buy. American right. stuff that right. uh, and the the military industrial complex that is an engine that runs on it's you know it's like a, a free will it just continues and continues right. so uh, it could be replaced by another engine that is good for as a Keynesian engine underneath the economy like looking after infrastructure etc but I think we discussed that the last time right. and uh, but that means making so many changes and killing off so many profitable uh, channels to uh, to too many people that it will it, it hasn't happened uh, so but NATO many, then so NATO has steadily gained membership across Eastern Europe is that it was Clinton that was it was Clinton that of course it was um, it was Baker, uh, James Baker had promised to Gorbachev. This was when, this was when uh, the issue of German reunification right. was uh, being discussed. And Gorbachev was obviously uh, uh, worried about a united Germany because after all, the Germans had been a problem to put it mildly for Russia for right. a very long time. And so uh, James Baker said, uh, that NATO would not extend one inch eastward. And uh, that promise was later confirmed by many European heads of state. So it's not something that you can say, well, it's net right. news or something, it's, it's fake news, which of course is, is what the, uh, the so-called uh, uh, fact checkers are, are saying is all oh, is not not true. Uh, it's uh, fake news. No, it's not fake news, and you can trace it. Many heads of state concurred. Right. So what happened was that Clinton. Also, we, we, people are not sure why. Maybe because of the Polish vote or something like that. It, it's hard to. Uh, there's a number of theories. He just suddenly made several countries a member, and. This what, is something. Do you remember that, the year of the first year he did? Uh, no, I would have to. Okay, uh, we'd have uh, to go look it up. I'll look this it. This is uh, well, uh, Clinton. I mean, uh, you. Uh, when was he president? Uh, and and after that, it became much more because that was then it became clear you could use. Those in NATO who were willing, the coalition of the willing, that was under uh, uh, George W. Bush. 
you could use them for operations. You could use them to clear up things. You could use them to, uh, to do certain tasks that American military didn't want to do in, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and, and so on. And then, of course, it starts, it starts expanding. The North Atlantic Treaty starts expanding to the North Pacific. Uh, what's, uh, this is, of course, against China. Uh, and uh, this goes on. I, th I think that what has recently happened, and this I'm going running ahead of the story, which you may not like, but it's, uh, uh, we are also seeing the beginnings of the end of NATO. It can't continue. But that's a story we get to later. Okay. So, so Clinton started with the bombing of Kosovo. You know, we started to see the NATO become very, really, on the offense. So why did Europe agree to that? Why did Europe go along with NATO turning to literally military offense? Well, there was, uh, there was some disunity at that time. Uh -huh. I think that there was not a... Uh, I remember, uh, not very clearly, but I remember... Uh, also in the media in the Netherlands, there was considerable uh, disagreement. Right. Uh, and uh, no, I discussed this at the time with my former uh, uh, editor, foreign editor, uh, who was also a deputy chief editor. And, uh, and we were, it was clear that there was not great unity. It okay. had to be, it, I mean, of course it was in the end, uh, there was not an effective opposition to it, but right. uh, well, there wasn't. I mean, Europe has functioned more so after the collapse of the Soviet Union than after World War II. Union, Europe was a bunch of vessels of the U.S., but right. originally, the origin, the Except idea. For the UK. <laughs> you know, well, no, also. Also, you know, I remember, I remember moments, times where the, 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 the Brits were told, no, 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 you're going, you, you have to go to another window for, for this. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, that began, during, I mean, the, the post-war, the, the, the Cold War, Europe was more of a ally, a genuine ally. Uh, of course, a um, subordinate ally. There was never any doubt who was uh, the, the, the primus inter pares, of course. This, right. There was never any doubt about that. But <clears throat> it became a vessel, a, 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 it, I mean, the, the alliance changed and it became a system of vassalage after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So, so NATO has moved steadily, has added members steadily, yes. and, and is encircling Russia. Yeah. But they're also making moves into Asia. So we get to the Ukraine, and one of the big issues, of course, in the Ukraine was Russia was clear they did not want Ukraine going into the EU or NATO. Now, let me just stop there and tell you a story. Um, in 2019, I went to Copenhagen with uh, a friend to, who was giving a speech. And believe it or not, the reason I went to Copenhagen is I've always wanted to see The Little Mermaid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I was, it was kind of a break for me. And I accompanied him to his speech. Mm -hmm. And he was speaking about anthroposophy. He was not there to no, talk no, politics. No. But in the middle of the speech, he just happened to make a reference to NATO he wasn't talking about NATO. He wasn't there to discuss NATO. He wasn't interested in NATO. It just came up. And a man in the audience, and it was a very respectable, well-educated, well-heeled audience, small, broke in, interrupted him in the middle of the speech, which is extraordinary in a, in a conversation like that, and said with absolute fear in his voice, do not mention NATO we could go to you know we can go to you can be prosecuted and go to jail if you criticize NATO and the whole audience the whole place just froze 
And I tried to confirm this later, and my understanding is legislation had been proposed, but I'm not clear that it had passed. I could never get final confirmation on that. But you were not allowed to discuss NATO. And, and the fear in the room was extraordinary. And I thought, Could what happened been, in Denmark? <laughs> well, yeah, no, but that might have been in connection with some particular Danish political moment. Right. Uh, because that kind, of, that kind of situation I don't recall uh, existing here or in Germany or uh, So in this Belgium, was or, Danish legislation. I will tell you, I just got back from Sweden. Mm -hmm. And um, the tension over the last decade in Sweden of the pressure yes. from the Americans to join NATO. I mean, it just, it sounds like a political war that yes. is just yeah. Yeah. extraordinary. And of course, we've seen the articles about, about the politics in Finland. So well, the pressure- Well, you know, this is, again, uh, it's, the, it's an impulsive move, an impulsive statement by the prime minister of Finland, who is, uh, a very young lady and uh, she is on social media and she feels the pressure, this pro-Ukraine pressure, etc. And she wants to show, uh, she wants to you know, demonstrate virtue. I mean, she is part of a generation that believes in a lot of virtue signaling of many things. I mean, she's, uh, that's, that is clear. I also think that she is still wet behind the ears. And she then spontaneously said, oh, you know, I have to have a, 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 we have to apply for membership. I don't think that the Finns who have the longest history of working with the Russians in some sort of, a, in, in, with an arrangement throughout the whole, the whole uh, I mean, there was of course a war with right. uh, Finland and Russia. And the Finns were greatly admired the world over of the way in which they stood their ground. Right. Uh, and I remember uh, in Moscow, I was at a, at a time when there was a, a commemoration. I think this was around May, uh, the 9th of May, the commemoration of the end of the war, etc. And I went to a, a war museum and I saw there uh, some old uh, Soviet military with bedecked with medals and wonderful, <laughs> wonderful people to see. And I asked them, what was your most memorable? And they said, the war with Finland. And I asked them, what, what did you think? And they said, they were, they were opponents. It's incredible. It's just a little, little uh, you know, uh, thing. This. So uh, I don't think that the Finns who are still there in Finland, whereas this young lady who calls herself prime minister because she's happened to win an, an, an election, uh, that these people who have the experience of working with Russia are going to say, yes, why don't we become a member of... I don't think so. So, but <laughs> when you look at these two efforts, the yeah. Treaty and the NATO, I, I just see, I, I haven't had, I didn't send it to you. I just saw an extraordinary speech in April by the Chinese foreign minister. You know, the Chinese are always so careful, always so, you know, not threatening other people's face. This guy was furious and basically made it sound like NATO was a conspiracy to take over the world. You know, and he, he referred to it coming to it. You could see how frustrated and angry he yeah, was. Yeah. And, um, uh, and just, it was bubbling over with his frustration. And you've seen that from the Indians too. So, but but you see this push by the, it, you almost have a, uh, I almost have this image of the, the health guy saying, oh, we can take over the world first. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so it's like a race by different cartels. The military guys are trying to take it over through NATO. You know, the weapons manufacturers are trying to take over the world through the NATO and the health guys are trying to take it over through the who. And it's a race of these different cartels to assert complete central control. And the, the, the frustrating thing about it is, it, it, in one sense, it's so ridiculous. Of course it is. It's so ridiculous. No. But, but the harm that it's doing is so devastating. Well, the reaction also, I think, you have to see the reaction in terms of you are insulting our intelligence, my intelligence. You right. dare, you dare make fun of us. Don't do that. Right. I mean, this is, 
I don't think that they are f scared of NATO expanding in the... It, it, this NATO is not going to be effective anywhere. Uh, I think that NATO exists... They're a bunch of cowards, basically. They're not going to fight uh, uh, China. They're not going to fight over uh, Taiwan or anything like that. Uh, they're not going to fight Russia. I mean, this is something so very clear. NATO doesn't want to... The, the member states of NATO don't want to fight Russia. I mean, right. Stoltenberg, the, the, the Norwegian head, the official head uh, of, of NATO, says that it is about time that we do, but uh, the member states won't fight Russia in the Ukraine. Of course not. They're, they're volunteers. Right. And there are some, in, there, yes, there are instructors, uh, NATO instructors that have been, uh, that have infiltrated the uh, military, uh, the Ukrainian military since 2014, since so, the coup d'etat. So one of the they, issues <clears throat> that, that many people listening to this or some people may not understand is that there is a provision in the NATO agreements, Article 5, yeah. so that if one country is attacked, it's, yeah. self de it's a collective <clears throat> self-defense, all the other countries automatically have to yes, that's right. help defend. That's right. So if America should have a false flag yeah. and then exercise an Article 5, everybody has to join the war on terrorism because yeah. America's been If attacked. they still believe it. Well, there's a lot of disbelief. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think really? They, why, why would that be? <laughs> no, I think this is important to see that the, of, the official facade of NATO, I mean, you mentioned Article 5, in, in, in its, its uh, whatever you call it, the charter, uh, it says that a country can only become a member if it's invited to do so. Uh, you can't apply for membership. And then it can only be accepted by the rest of NATO if that country is not involved in a war right. or uh, in a situation where it could easily be drawn in. I mean, right. this, is, this is part of the, the charter. Right. So the NATO, by saying, oh, you know, become members. And, uh, you know, uh, Ursula von der Leyen goes to, uh, to Kiev and, and gives Zelensky a, a list of, this is fill in. And, you know, if you, uh, uh, if, you, if you fill it in right, this is about the EU, but it is the same, it works the same way with NATO. It's uh, uh, Well, here's the question. Did Zelensky <laughs> have his shirt on and was he wearing leather pants? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, some of this is too silly to be, uh, right. you know, to be taken seriously. Right. But it is a problem, of course, because NATO is a, a facade, and you can do a lot of things behind that facade, and you can claim, yeah, the Europeans are with us. Yeah, you know, the Europeans are engaged by NATO. They right. can't have their own foreign policy because they have NATO. And it is when, when, when you have a defense policy that is looked after by the US, then you can't have a foreign policy that is independent. I just, I mentioned to you, I just saw the, the video of the French reporter reporting on the yeah, fact that yeah, yeah. the Americans were running the Ukrainian yeah. military. Well, they, they're running, yeah, they're, they, <laughs> this is something, they are running the people, the, the, the people that volunteer to fight in Ukraine, right. which means there's certain death if they ever get caught. Uh, so uh, these people are sorted out by American uh, officials. So it's the Americans who, uh, who, and then, but we know that behind the scenes, the uh, Americans are uh, in fact, running the military operation. So uh, it sounded to me as though it was a military veteran, but probably a mercenary or contractor, is what it sounded like to me. I think that, there, of course, there are contractors. There are, yeah. there's, a whole, uh, there's a whole, I think we discussed this the last time. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, but we see more and more that, the, like Mariupol, you know, the, 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 the big steelworks in Mariupol, we the, there's a whole network of tunnels underneath and they're hiding. The most, the, the most steadfast, of over a thousand uh, uh, normal Ukrainian uh, soldiers. So that's the, the original Ukrainian uh, 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 armed forces have uh, um, have surrendered and have right. gone home. 
Right. They've gone home. They could go home they're there to their wives, you know, don't uh, come back fighting us and uh, it's all fine. Uh, but there are some very, the, the diehards are underneath. This is the, the, the what has remained of the Azov, so-called Azov Battalion. Right. And they have foreigners with them in, these, in this complex. And um, it's generally understood that there is a, um, a significant uh, detachment of the French Foreign Legion. Of course, they're also, well, you know, they, they, they're specialists in this kind of thing. Well, Plus... Uh, an, an, an American general plus... Uh, <clears throat> One of my concerns is the dramatic increase in corporate mercenary capacity yes. has yeah. given... Yeah. As Eric Prince and uh, what is now called Academy. But the, it's given the, the, I call it the Anglo-American Alliance, the capacity to cook these things up. Outsourcing of war. Yeah. And we've but, seen this in but the, to outsource war so you can cook it up yeah, right, to the point right, where yeah, you can build yeah, the coalitions yeah. to get... We've seen it in Iraq, we've seen it in Afghanistan. I think at some point in Iraq, from what I remember, half the fighting people there, or half the military people there were contract, were mercenaries. So I just met with people who have a lot more experience in European politics than I do, and I said, why would the Germans go along you know, because the whole idea of the global chessboard is keep the Germans from getting together with the Russians. Why, why would the Germans go along with this? And he said, the Germans have been promised the Ukraine. The German industrialists, they think they're going to get the Ukraine and they're kind of, you know, licking their chops and, and that's, they think it's going to work. They would absolutely love it. They would, it's the, the uh, that's Azok style. Uh, uh, that complex that I mentioned just earlier is the biggest steel. It's, a, it's I think two yeah for the two factories. Road. It's yeah. the biggest in the steel uh, works in the world. Right, and then you have the and meat. it could do a lot. I mean, it could be very valuable, of course, to uh, the Russians and to the Germans, as you say. Now, if the Germans manage to become friends with the Russians, then they have a good chance, and who knows. But if I they think this is not. Up, it doesn't, if they can pick the whole thing up th cheap through NATO, they can't. I mean, what well, can they NATO think do? They can. No, 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 no. I don't think that. I think no, they no, can. no, no. I don't think so. No, of course not. How I, can they? How could they? I, I think. I think. And NATO that, would have to. NATO uh, would have to I, occupy Ukraine. I think that no. All they have to do is get the Ukraine in the e in the EU. And then all these assets, because they've been devastated by what's happened, can be picked up for cheap. No, but the, the Ukraine is not going to be part of the EU. These guys think it's yeah, going to Yeah, they work. think so, but no, it's not going to happen. Well, but if, it's, if that happens, it's why also the so? end of the EU. Why do, why do they think so? I'm, <laughs> we are told to lower our voices. Ah, I thought the editor but, could sort of turn but, up and down. But these yeah. guys think they're going to win. <clears throat> no, they don't think that. You think they think they're going to fail? They, that's the propaganda. That's the psyop. We're winning. No, I, I don't mean the, they're the going idea, to win. The idea that the, the idea that the, the 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 NATO is winning in Ukraine is part of the psyop. No, I think they they believe over a long period of time, the sanctions are going to work, and uh, and the Russians will not be able to assert. Uh, uh, the multipolar sovereign, you know, sovereign, national sovereignty in a multipolar world. Well, I think they're very wrong. The sanctions well, have backfired. I know you think they're wrong, but why do they believe they're right? No, they don't think so. It's, I think that it's part of the PSYOP. You mislead a lot of people, and those people include some of the people that are pretty high up in governments and in, in institutions that participate in government. Of course. So these people may believe it, but the people who think, the people who have worked it out, the people who've really th thought it out, and they're not re being reduced to zero, those people, in the US or in, uh, uh, in Europe, they don't believe that. They see this as a result of the PSYOP, of the succession of I, PSYOP. I, I think the Brits and the Americans really believe they're going to win. I think they think... Over a long period of time, the sanctions will so drain Russia and the demographics in Russia are going against Russia that they can end up relatively in a more powerful position than if they didn't do this. 
I, uh, the demographics part, I have not studied closely, but I have seen what has happened as a result of the sanctions, which has forced Putin to take a number of measures that have really backfired and that, are, that have, of course, created a situation in Europe that's almost untenable. And that is going to force the German industrialists to come to some decision at some point pretty soon. You have the CEO of the largest chemical corporation in the world, uh, Basf, mm -hmm. saying that uh, if this continues and if we don't uh, change it, the situation, then Germany is going to suffer through the absolute worst conditions comparable to the German conditions at the end of the war. So you have to think of inside Germany it's quite at the end of the war. Statement. It's, it's unbelievable. Right. And he is a very important industrialist. Right. And there are many other German industrialists who think like him. And they want Nord Stream 2. They want the gas. They want the, the, an unimpeded flow from the other uh, gases. It's 40% to, to Europe. And <clears throat> It's at the moment they cannot do that, of course. But at the moment, everybody has to demonstrate uh, its, I mean, into its, its virtue signaling uh, from, uh, from but, here to there. But why? But at some point, they're going to work on... And then Schultz will have uh, a decision to make. Is he going to step down? Is he going to change his government? Is he going to... Or is he going to be replaced? Right. Okay. We, are, we are living in revolutionary times. I guarantee you that. And that's as a result of what Putin has done in reaction to the sanctions and the freezing of Russian assets in, uh, in Western uh, banks. Now, do you believe that part of the goal, and I'll just call it the, you know, the Anglo-American alliance, do you think one of their goals is regime change and they think they can get it? Regime change where? In Russia. It's always, uh, I mean, this is uh, a, uh, a desire that is very old, that goes back, of course, to uh, the Yeltsin years, right. when, uh, when they all, it almost happened. Well, my, uh, my impression is they, the Americans made a decision not to bring the government down completely. I mean, they just, you know, they wrecked the place. But they were afraid of if there was no government, what would happen to the nuclear capacity? It's what they said. No, I think that they, Russia was on the point of disintegration right. when Putin uh, uh, inherited uh, the presidency from right. Yeltsin, the last day of the 20th century. It was New Year's Eve, 20th century. century. And... Uh, he was immediately aware of uh, the great threat to the Russian Federation of disintegrating. It would fall apart in, in feudal type. And the oligarchs had uh, established themselves as minor uh, right. princes uh, with their own armies, their own police force and everything. And so uh, what Putin had to do from the outset was an enormous complex uh, balancing act with not one opponent but with a whole assortment of opponents and these were the Atlanticists in Moscow and in, uh, in St. Petersburg who believed that the future uh, as part of Europe and the whole Western thing was, uh, was, was preferable uh, and of course maybe they were thinking correctly but it was the United States didn't want that because that would have meant, you know, a, uh, a uh, undermining of the hegemonic ambition. So then, uh, gradually, Putin uh, managed to uh, organize the oligarchs. It's a long story, a very interesting story. Some could remain and others were sort of in exile or self-imposed exile. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and he, he did so very well. It was... It was when I saw that happening, I thought this is a statesman of a caliber that we haven't seen anywhere. This is, this is so well done. I mean, it's, this is Bismarck. This is... Uh, uh, so uh, then, of course, we always got this opposition. It never disappeared. There was always a fifth column. 
There were always NGOs were allowed to operate in Moscow with the specific purpose of undermining the Russian right. Federation. He finally kicked it them never, out. And he finally got rid of them. As a result of this, of the, the sanctions were the means, the sanctions placed upon Russia were the means for Putin to respond in a way that the West was not prepared for. And of course, it was, it was a masterstroke. The, the fact that they had left Russian assets in Western banks was a trap. Right? It was, it, you see, you hear some uh, critics saying it was Elvira uh, Nebolina, uh, the, the, the governor of the Russian Central Bank, who is, who comes out of this nest of, of neo, uh, 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 neoliberal uh, reformers. But it was a mistake by her, no. Well, this was a trap. And the U.S. jumped right into this trap, making clear to all and sundry that your savings are not safe in Western banks if you do something that is that the U.S. doesn't like because it will freeze your assets. So the U.S. has done this before. Russia's not the first. No, Russia's just the first no, it, no, no. Venezuela, are. Venezuela right. got its asset by the by the Brits, and Venezuela. It's a small place. It was the Brits. This wasn't the same thing. Right. And there were maybe other things. But this is so big. I mean, the Russian assets is not nothing. The, well, it was so big that this was, this was momentous. And what it has meant is that it's the end of the petrodollar. Finished. So, but, but let me just say, because it's getting more complicated. They froze the Russian assets and the, the central banking assets. Yeah. But what they've also done... The first payment by the Russians, so the United States debt is approximately 140% of their GDP. Russia's debt is approximately nothing. 18%. Yes, practically right. nothing. So Russia does not, you know, the, the Anglo-American alliance always put people in a debt trap and they can't put Russia right. in a debt trap. Right. That's part of the lesson Russia learned after right. the 90s. That's right. So on the first debt payment, the Russians, the, uh, I think it was Citibank, agreed to process the payment, and the payment got made. Now the Western banks are refusing to process the payment. So even though the Russians can't use their money sitting in the bank accounts in the Western banks, the Western banks refuse to process their payment to pay the debt. And they're trying to take the position that the Russians are defaulting on their right. debt. In the, you know, in my world, this is called a contrived default. Yes. Because they're not letting you pay the debt no. service, and then they're saying you defaulted. It doesn't concern Putin. I mean, he's way above it. What he has done has had far greater impact. He's brought gold back. And that means that other countries still are thinking... Uh, uh, so uh, I'm going to stop you there, yes. because... because Putin started in 2005 to bring the gold back. So he's been accumulating gold and moving to this. And we've watched the global rebalancing of the gold inventory since then. So this has been going on for a long time. Yeah, but he's and bringing the gold back as support of the ruble. No, he's, he's brought it back in support of the ruble domestically, not yes. internationally. What he also did is he set up an office, the Central Bank of Russia set up an office many years ago in China, so they could transact gold. So he's got gold transacting with the Chinese through Beijing, through Moscow, Beijing, direct linkage, and he's got it as a set domestically, but it's not a gold standard globally. Okay, a very important uh, bit of news that you must have seen, I think, is that uh, when this was developing in the early stages of his development, uh, since uh, Putin's measures, it was uh, Biden, or at least somebody on behalf of Biden, who called the Saudis. <laughs> the Saudis were the origin, origin right. of the petrodollar. Right, right. No answer. Mm -hmm. It's the first time right. that the Saudis haven't responded, or haven't answered a call from the American president. So, and I was so what does it mean? The, the, the Saudis and China have made a deal? Mm -hmm. India and China have made a deal. The Saudis, and in, they're all making deals. Right. And it's not with petrodollars. Right. 
It's with gold and their own currency. Right. And they are developing, or they're trying to develop, they have to still, from what I understand, they still have to find a real formula for a substitute of a reserve currency. And the Chinese and the Russians are working on that together. So if you, I think I sent you our wrap-up state of our currency, but if you look at the work they've been doing through the BRICS for 15 years to build all these things, they've been working on this steadily for 15 years. That's right. And, and now what they're trying to do, so in 2019, the BRICS agreed to China, India, yeah. Russia yeah. to come up with a cold back BRICS currency. That's when the Americans moved with the going direct and the G7 bankers moved with going direct. And, right. and to a certain extent, going direct was meant to sort of jump the curve on the BRICS plan. Yeah. And so the BRICS thing kind of seemed to fall apart. And now they're trying to negotiate a commodity based basket. Yeah, that's instead another of just, one of the things. Instead of and just it's going. out of it is it is this is a, we are living in revolutionary times. The yep. situation has dramatically changed. The world has changed. It's is a very good Dutch expression. It's on loose screws. <laughs> it can you know it goes it can go anywhere. And in fact, it is on such loose screws that you wonder whether there's still screws left. Right. So this is our situation. And a lot of what we are saying is speculation based on insufficient information, but especially in, insufficient understanding of the complexity of the, of the results that can happen. So but this is what I want to talk about a little bit more in detail because yes. it's vitally important. Several other things have happened that I think are crucially important for much of Asia, even for Japan, and for, uh, for, the South, for South Asia, for Africa and uh, Latin America. So there are two things I wanted to point out to you. One is, uh, you know, the last time we talked about this, I said one of the questions was, who would the South support? Because when you come to these moments when the BRICs start to organize, the U.S. is always, or the Anglo-American Alliance is always able to sort of divide and conquer the South and keep the South from supporting, in this case, the Russians and China. And if you look at the yeah, map... they're intimidated all the time. Well, but here's the thing. If you look at the map, nobody's come swarming in support of the Anglo-American alliance. The South has not gone along. I mean, exactly. That's what I'm saying. Well, that's big. Yeah. That's it's, huge. It's huge. It's huge. It's huge. Okay, so I want to mention something else. <laughs> I saw the, the Indian foreign minister was in the U.S. for a summit, on the, on the, including <clears throat> on the sanction issues. And here's a guy who's as schooled in diplomacy. You know, he's not quite a Lavrov, but he's good. And he's shaking with frustration yeah, 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 because yeah, he's, yeah. They're, trying to, they're trying to get him to say okay. that the Indians will go along with yeah. the sanctions no, on no. buying Russian let me, gas. Let Wait, me, let me finish. Uh, and, I have a prediction. Okay. And, right. and he's, he's, he's literally shaking. He's saying... He said, Europe is currently, the U.S. and Europe is currently importing in an afternoon yeah. more Russian oil and gas than yeah, we then, buy right, in a right, month. Right, 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 right. And, and what he's saying, it's the same thing as the foreign minister from China. The, the divide is, to these people, words have no meaning. And they feel free to say up is down and down is up. And he's trying to negotiate as if words have meaning. Yeah. And these two worlds are clashing because yes. one yeah. is got no screws left right and the other is trying to buckle yep, exactly is trying yeah, to get the yeah. screws in That's place a very well right. extremely well said <laughs> i wish i i wish i'd thought of that well he's so, trying to get the screws back, in, back place. in yeah and these it guys won't work yeah. right wonderful right um uh, maybe this is the title of your uh, anyway <laughs> <laughs> my prediction small predictions uh -huh. With India, we are going to see a media, an American media, that's going to get itself worked up uh, about uh, human rights violations in India. Prediction. Uh, for Pakistan, I, it was too late. It happened before anything could be predicted. A I regime was stunned changed. that they were able to take Khan out. I couldn't. A regime change in fast. Pakistan. Right. There are millions on the streets in Lahore and Rawalpindi everywhere. Really? They are not accepting it. That is no, the, the media, no, they are, It's absolutely, it's unbelievable. And then you think, 
okay, the, the Pakistan military are in a powerful position. Right. I'm, evil tongues say they run the show, but they are not going to settle for this. And also, really? already, already, wow. now okay. we don't know for sure, right. already the Pakistanis have so much benefit of Chinese one belt, one roads, infrastructural right. investing, they're not going to sit idly by and allow this color revolution regime change to continue. So unless Washington pulls something out of his head that is at this moment impossible to, 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 to predict, and it's, that is a possibility, uh, this is not going to go through. But who knows? It's an, an one little thing that is happening and that has repercussions throughout the whole Eurasian region. Because we had a Eurasian bloc that was taking shape and was consolidating. And Pakistan was part of it. And India was part of it. Imagine, India and Pakistan together. Unbelievable. Right. Right. So uh, all these things hang together. And all these things, it means eliminating eliminating that very essential American influence that was throughout everything, through the hair lines of, right. of everything. So, and, so I see a couple things operating here, and I just want to flush them out. One is this desire. Many people who have gone along in the past are not going along because they need a world in which words are real and yes. contracts matter. Yeah. So this problem of the neocons and their culture not being agreement capable is big. Yes. The second thing that's going on is what, you know, and we don't need to get into it, but I believe that the Anglo-American Alliance and the G7 have very powerful military capacity that is invisible to the common man. And that is what has pulled the, you know, the rabbit out of the hat in times past. The question is, can it pull it out of the hat now? I don't know. Um, you know, so that's a question mark. But there's something else, and and it to a certain extent it relates to the agreement capable. I think that what is coming through the leadership on the American side is a culture which is so offensive to so many people yeah. that they would rather die fighting yeah. than right. live with it. Right. Well, and, and Putin uh, uh, has given that voice more than anyone yes, else. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think that we can come back to this when I, well, I want to go into this a little bit uh, more fully. But on the US, we all know we'll have midterm elections in November. Very important. We all know that uh, the laptop, Hayden, that, uh, that uh, Hunter Hayden's laptop is being revealed, what is right. on there. We all know that the Democrats must be extraordinarily embarrassed with, with Biden and maybe telling him, why don't you resign in peace and, and uh, give us a chance to, uh, to not come out completely down in uh, November. We know that many things are happening, and we know that there is no uh, no unity between the federal government and many of the states. Uh, we have uh, DeSantis in Florida, we have Mexico, we have uh, Texas, right. and they are not uh, online. What is forbidden in one state is is uh, is obligatory in the next with 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 masks, and uh, and you can go on a long time. So. The U.S., I, I saw that as a possible point of light in our future, because Europe is totally hopeless at the moment. Has been now. The, the whole two years of COVID-19 has right. been hopeless. But, the Europe, but in, in the U.S., you saw a little spark of hope. And, and uh, I am very pro-American. Many people uh, think the opposite. Because I also in Japan, I kept saying, you know, watch out with your relationship with with uh, the U.S. and mm -hmm. you are not, you should not behave as slaves. But uh, <coughs> I'm not anti-American. I think that the American ruling segment was hijacked by the wrong people, and uh, and. You know, it started with what we discussed earlier, this whole notion of unipolar rule. 
and then whatever happens after, you can go into details, etc. But this is this is a very important yes. element in yes, all this absolutely. because the Great Reset, uh, you know, the, the the Great Reset, Davos or whatever you want to call it, is it, the question is whether the U.S. is still going to go along with that. Many parts of the U.S. are not, I think. But then we come back, then we are talking about the, the financial bunch that is in the Great Reset. The, right. the, the criminals in the financial world, both, both the central banks and, uh, and the, the Fed, of course, and, uh, uh, and the uh, investment managers like BlackRock, and Larry Fink and, and the like, right. etc. cetera. This is the, there's an area where many things could still happen. Uh, also as a response to what Putin is trying to do. But I think at some point, I don't know whether you want to do this now or whether you, you, you followed your, what you, your train of thought, because I am respectful of, of what you, right. how you wanted this to go. But, well, uh, there, yeah, so there's been this controversy about, on one hand, you have the control grid, which new technology makes it possible. Yeah for extraordinary central control using digital means, so the passports, the CBDCs. And we've written a lot about that. So, so you have technology building a control grid at the same time, you, and which compromises individual sovereignty. At the same time, it's not just individual sovereignty, it's national sovereignty. So you have the Russians and the Chinese pushing hard to protect their national sovereignty, India too, at the same time, if you look internally, they are each in uh, different ways implementing this control grid internally. So, and I believe that control grid uh, very much compromises individual sovereignty, which raises the question, you know, and which creates a lot of confusion. Are, the, are they fighting for national sovereignty, but looking internally to control individual sovereignty? So, so this this mm. control impulse yeah. is very. Yeah. I I can, I can imagine an answer. To the question, whether because it's these these are opinions that that do the rounds uh, that the Chinese and the Russians are in some three dimensional chess kind of way uh, uh, secretly and uh, blah blah part of the Great Reset. So that's the question. Are the Russians and the Chinese part of the, the well, I call it the going direct reset. Yeah, okay. So you're adamant that, that they are not a separate faction. They're really uh, separate. Even though if you look at, you know, their loyal, you know, they, they've pledged allegiance to the sustainable development goals and they show up at the World Economic <laughs> Forum. If you read the sustainable development goals, I don't think anybody disagrees. It's poverty should be wiped out, uh, insecurity should go. We should have an, uh, an environment that's safe. We should. I mean, the the the. the, 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 the but we know yeah. we can read into this what it actually meant, what is actually happening. But on the surface, on the face of it, nobody disagrees with the, right. it. Right. It, it all so, sounds perfectly reasonable. So I mean, if uh, when uh, Putin meets uh, Xi Jinping uh, at the, the opening of the Olympic Games, the Winter Games. And they they will they come out with a manifest. The, the bureaucrats have put that in because everybody you know they, they, it's cut and paste. Okay, it means nothing. It's not that that Putin and Xi Jinping have been discussing the World Economic Forum in those terms. No, they've been discussing the world in very different terms. And you have to read you have to really read and listen to what they're saying. And that means no unipolar world, we want a multipolar world right. and we want respect all around and cooperation all around and uh, an, an respect and a more than a respect, an understanding that mankind cannot survive unless it realizes the, the, the best means of living together. Right, but if you if you look at the control grid they're putting into place domestically, <coughs> the question is, you know, do they want they want national sovereignty, but do they want to end individual sovereignty? Oh. 
within the country. I think that the, the control grid, the, the uh, digital, rec the face recognition, the whole, whatever they, they do, uh, it's a technology that gives uh, a government, any government, the kind of means to keep a check on the population. But uh, how do we know? That is too, that is too, you're not going to, you are not going to do away with it unless there is a very strong public outcry against it which forces you to come up with a different right. domestic policy. And the, the, the Chinese, this, this would take us a too long time because the Chinese uh, control system, the social credit system, is not what many people believe it is. It has a different ultimate purpose. The ultimate purpose is harmony, the absence of conflict that could lead to a disintegration of a community and ultimately the disintegration of China. This is the great fear throughout Chinese history, is disintegration. Right. And I know of, because of the history of these control systems that existed before, before we had the technology, the Japanese imported it. I know how it works in, had worked in different parts in Japanese history. And I think that I understand, not fully, I don't know 100%, but uh, I think that ultimately you, you look at this more from a point of view of Confucian understandings, con Confucian things that are taken for granted, Confucian beliefs and ideas, than uh, what we think in the way of superimposing total control over an entire population. Well, that is so, how it is seen so, in Washington. So there are two questions. One is, many people in the West who are fighting for individual sovereignty look at Russia and China and say, these are totalitarian societies. Yeah, they're not. So, so that's number one. Yeah, they're not. Or, or they say they're more compromising of individual sovereignty but, than where the, we want to the, live. The, the idea, the notion that in some secret way, in some three-dimensional di three chess kind of complicated way, Putin and Xi Jinping are part of the Great Reset. It's something that is doing the rounds now. And it's, I think, a great detraction. And I think also it's being, being encouraged by the people who want to have the critical media, the alternative media, being distracted. So but okay, let me let me try to because okay, many of these people, jump in here. many people who 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 say this are, I think, honest people. Right. And I think there is a way. I I have I've written about Can this only recently. In? Yeah. So, you know, and this is a guess. This is conjecture. I believe the Anglo-American Alliance has done everything they can to get the Russians to invade the Ukraine or to make this move into the Ukraine. I think they engineered it. They, they put, uh, as John we, Sawyer we're changing said... This, we're changing the subject. I'm fully, no, 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 I'm coming back to it. Yeah, might, because but but I, what, you say, what, you think, say, what you say... I think they think if they can get the Russians to do this, yeah, it yeah. will help them... And they didn't. Them. The Russians didn't do what they wanted them to do. I disagree. It's something very different happened. Well, but I think the Russians, I think they wanted the Russians to take this step. Not, not like this. The uh, Russians responded, no, I, 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 I tell you. This, this, is <laughs> going, this is helping their reset. In other words. Yes and no. Yes. Yes and no. The, but the, the no, West, not in the way they wanted. The West is using Russia. You are completely. To facilitate are, no, no, their no, reset. No, no, you don't know that part of history. Uh, I, I, belie I believe that the, that the, that the Anglo-American alliance is using Russia to help them get their... They reason. wanted to, and they didn't succeed. Because Russia didn't That's do... not clear to me. No, they wanted to get Russia to invade uh, Ukraine. But not in the way that? it happened. Uh, that may be. That's very important. That may be. That's very important. That may be, but... It's very important. You're confident They were that misreading. They were misreading Putin. They were misreading... You know, I mean, is this is really... Is, it would take an hour to go into this. Right. But it's, it's, if you want to do it, I don't think we should. I think we should go on with, the, with okay. the private public. Because the people who are saying this, uh, there is a secret... In a secret way, they are supporting the Great Restart. And they have a number of reasons they give 
for this. They are very slim, very slim reasons, flimsy arguments. But <laughs> they're honest people. And I think that at a time when you have honest people disagreeing on something so important, so uh, fundamental, uh, it sometimes helps to come up with a perspective that is completely different from the commonly expected, the, the, the common ex accepted perspective in which these things are viewed. And I propose to do this with something that is a perspective that's almost forgotten. And that is the perspective of the phenomenon of sovereignty and uh, the phenomenon of a sovereign state having public and private sectors. Mm -hmm. Few people have concerned themselves with this, but we can make an immediate, an immediate uh, pronouncement about the aims of the Great Reset, the aims of uh, Davos, that is the ultimate victory of the private sector, part of the private sector, the elect, the top, not the medium and, and small businesses, that the ultimate success over all the public sectors of all the countries in the world. That is the, 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 the success, that's how the success of the great restart. So let's talk about private and public. In the private sector, you have um, entrepreneurs, uh, you have uh, people who try to make money uh, and build capital and whatnot, riches. In the public sector, if it functions the way it's supposed to, uh, you have officials who make sure that the interests of the public, all of us, are looked after. And at the same time, of course, that includes also those things that are necessary for the continuation of the state. Without the state, you don't have sovereignty of anything. Right. The state is, can be sovereign. And if you take away the sovereignty of the state, it means a very important thing. It means that citizenship is no longer possible because you can only be a citizen of a sovereign state. And it is the public sector that makes sure that your interests as a citizen are looked after in one way or another. Uh -huh. So keep this division in mind, public and private. What we see in Russia is the reassertion by Putin of the sovereignty of the Russian Federation of the state. He has been do trying to achieve this by what we mentioned earlier, by gradually getting rid of the opponents that belong to the uh, neoliberal cliques in the yeah. cities, the fifth column, people who wanted to undermine uh, Russia and so on. And he is now more successful than he has been before. The the firing of Chubais was for me a, I mean, the ultimate example of this. Here you have a functionary who was together with Gaidar uh, at the time of Yeltsin's privatization uh, uh, campaign. He was the architect of privatization. Right. And he kept, he was kept on by Putin and he had different positions in his thing. Of course, Putin had to work with the people that were there when he got in. He needed them to, to rule, to, to, to know anything what was happening. He needed the connections, he needed his assistance, etc. And he kept, and the last function that Chubais had was as a kind of emissary to the World Economic Forum, to the uh, sustainable uh, things, etc. That was his official function, he's out very, very dramatic, very, because he was a, a hugely, a very well known and a hugely important figure. Very dramatic move. As just an example, Putin is uh, engaged in resurrecting things that actually never existed to the full in Russia, because 
Tsarist Russia was partly a relic of feudal times. Now, of course, uh, Tsarist Russia uh, had developed beyond feudalism, but it hadn't had the, the, the history that the Europeans post-feudal uh, countries, I mean, the, the, the uh, feudalism has no distinction between public and private uh, interests, public and private sectors. Uh, they emerge gradually over the course of some 200 years with the bourgeoisie, with the importance of cities, with, with the guilds, with lots of things. Very interesting right. history. And then you get a fully established state with, with sovereignty that has two uh, others, the public and private sectors that keep order in the society and work very well and that make citizenship possible. So Tsarist Russia didn't have that developed. And when communism took over, command economies in communism do not recognize, by definition, private and public sectors. Right. Everything is public, right. officially. And so when uh, uh, Zubais and Gaidar set out we, under the guidance of the Harvard economists that were, you know, they were like missionaries there, uh, teaching people how to do things properly in the economy. Uh, when they set out to privatize Russian uh, state assets, there was no private sector to put these assets in. So what do you do? You can't just conjure up out of nothing a private sector. And a great catastrophe, as you know, a great catastrophe ensued that created the oligarchs at a, the greatest robbery of state assets in the history of mankind. We have never seen anything like that in history, right. at that, in that volume. So <clears throat> then, of course, when Putin then looked at the situation now, he has to make sure that there is a fully equipped and fully equipped private and public sectors that function like private and public sectors. He is actually doing this for the first time. And it is interesting to see then the commentary. You have this well-known Russian uh, Geo-economic genius, Glaviev, you've certainly heard about yeah, him. Very uh, he's very interesting. He's very interesting to read. Yeah. And he I think that he is he is on, on the ball. He is very good on many things he says, except when he goes into historical periods, etc., then he shouldn't do that because that's not, not that interesting to begin with. And you can't know these things that you uh, but he has been critical, very critical of the central bank. Uh, and Elvira uh, uh, Nabulimia. Oh, geez, I, I, I keep getting this name. I, uh, okay, so uh, because she is, has raised the, the, the prime rate to 20%, that's when he began critical. Of course, he's lowered it since to 17 because there was a threat of inflation, as she wanted to, and she followed the. As she was word, defending right? the ruble. Of course. So. And, uh, and we talked earlier about the, you know, the freeze the assets that, mm -hmm. were, that were a trap for, uh, I mentioned that earlier. But that is not the important thing. Because as the prime minister of uh, Russia, who was also given a speech recently, has said, we don't think of the central bank as the engine behind uh, industrial development. There are other ways. We think of the of the legal measures we take. We think of uh, uh, all manner of informal ways, etc. We have, we have other parts of the state. We have, uh, we have a legislature, we have an administrative entities. And suddenly, when I heard this, I really, I thought, my God, he says something that I have seen operate successfully when I first came to Japan and when I first studied North, uh, South yeah. Korea. Because what they do now, they give preferential treatment to biggies, to the big ones that are considered strategic industries, like shipbuilding, like civil uh, aviation, uh, and aircraft, and so on. <clears throat> so you choose, you select winners. This is, this is you know, anathema in, uh, in Washington. Say this is against, completely well, against Washington. Well, they do it in Washington. Yeah. Uh, yeah, of course they do, but <laughs> in a very <laughs> hidden way. But here, and, and the smaller ones, the small entrepreneurs, uh -huh. they are the small and medium-sized ones. They have access 
to fantastic loans against very favorable rates. And right. we help them in other ways. And I thought, my God, I see Japan in this period of, and in Korea, what this means is import substitution industrialization. It's a mouthful, but it was a very important formula that was used at one time in the time when people were very concerned about the underdeveloped world right. that was then called the developing world, the third world, whatever you wanted to call it. They used that recipe, import substitution industrialization. This is the formula. What you import, you should make yourself. Not everything, of course, that's right. not possible. The Japanese never decided to go into the oil business. They knew they could never, uh, the, the foreign oil firms had always a preferential treatment among the foreigners. Uh, but most of what you imported, you made, you started making yourself. That right. is the industrialization re recipe. Right. It was followed in Japan, it was followed in, uh, in uh, South Korea and in the Philippines. And in the Philippines, I saw what happened to it right. when the neoliberals took over. This is the IMF and the well, World the Bank. The neoliberals and they, are they, designed... they stopped it in its tracks. And I saw it in the 60s when I first lived in the Philippines. It was the most prosperous country in Asia after Japan. And then I saw it, I visited it regularly after that. And by the 70s, going into the 80s, all that was gone. And it became subtractor to the rest of the world. And that also meant that those uh, national uh, interests that were part of this whole sub subcontracting thing, they were the old rich people, of course, and they supplanted the original colonists. This is neo-colonialism, right. and it was preached by the IMF and the World Bank and so on. And it became the Washington Consensus, right. the, uh, Mrs. Uh, Thatcher said there's no alternative. Uh, it, was, uh, it was known as uh, the, um, well, we, we, you've all heard the slogans. Well, and this is neoliberalism. It's bringing poverty. Exactly, it right. brought poverty. So what Putin has said, or what the prime minister of uh, the Russian Federation has said, is that we go back to import substitution industrialization. Right. And this is significant because the rest of the underdeveloped world that has functioned under the aegis of the IMF and the World Bank, they're very important. I know this because I talk with diplomats who served in Africa and in, in uh, South America, and they, with these countries, were there was so much pressure. They couldn't go back to import substitution industrialization. They see this now in Russia as an example. This is completely different from what Klaus Schwab and co want to accomplish. Now go back for a moment. This is one thing, sovereignty. Sovereignty is crucial. What is the most important thing that Klaus Schwab and Davos, the Davos crowds want to do? We eliminate sovereignty altogether. Because right. that is the final victory of the, uh, of the top of the private sector. Here's no where, sovereignty. Here's where you and I have a serious disagreement. And that is, I see support in the West for Putin and what he's doing. And I think it's because it, it helps accelerate the process that they have underway. So it helps accelerate the shift to rebalancing the gold inventory. It accelerates the shift to do CBDC in the control grid. And so I just think that... Well, I, don't, I don't understand what you were just saying because the gold, I mean, by, by saying now we take gold as the base price for gold against the ruble. That means the first... Only domestically. Yeah, but that, Only never mind, never mind, because it's domestically, but the Arabs go for it, yeah, the yeah. Chinese go for it, India goes for it, Pakistan we don't know now because we don't know what's going to happen. But I think but Africa, I think, I Africa... Think that's and, all part of where Mr. Global wants to take no, the global No, of course country. not. We have to... It's out, of, it's out of their hands. That's going to be part three, okay? It's out of their hands <laughs> because I disagree. It's, it is the opposite of what they want. I come and if 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 
this, if this re-adoption of import substitution industrialization is accepted and brought back in in many parts of Africa and in uh, uh, South America, it's a real then problem it's the for opposite the of what uh, Schwab is trying to do. So, so there's who's at the exactly top. Exactly the opposite. There's who's at the top table and then who's at the middle table. And I think we're battling who's at the middle table and what models they get to do. But I don't, I don't see the battle about the top model because if the digital control grid goes into place. Yeah, but how is this? What kind of digital control is it going to be? If every human's on a blockchain, it's going to be slavery. Yeah, but that's not what they're thinking of. Control. That's not what they're. From what I understand, that the Chinese and the, and the Russians are trying to put together is a substitute for a reserve currency that is not gold or your own uh, currency. So a substitute for the dollar, because the dollar has been the favorite reserve currency ever since Bretton Woods. And uh, this is... So here's what I have to tell you. Yeah. Mr. Global couldn't care less whether it's the dollar, dollar or wampum. What Mr. Global wants is 100% digital because that's the control. And, and not, 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 depends on how you set it up. I have looked at the Bitcoin system and the other, uh, the other allied and, uh, and competing uh, 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 cryptocurrency uh, things, and there are different models that work differently. And you can find ways that are impossible to break into. There are other ways that are easily manipulable. It is, there is a whole world out there and there is not so, one kind. But, but it's not just, I, I'm not talking about crypto, I'm talking about digital. Yes, because that is digital. That, well, so is Visa. No, no, but I, no, no, I mean, no, I mean, <laughs> yeah, 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 no, it's it a, it's, you talk about blockchain in the way that like Bitcoin works. What, what, I, what I'm talking about is an all-digital system which can be controlled centrally using AI and software. So, yes, but you... But, you and you can do there it is, there are, there are this, there are this, if you if you If you study this uh, uh, crypto world, this cryptocurrency yeah. world, then you see that there are ways that are not controllable. I totally uh, disagree. No, no, no. I, I know. I know the. Totally I know disagree. the arguments. I know the I arguments. I totally but disagree. The, but the. But the. We don't know what the Russians and the Chinese until now have come up with. But I can assure you that they will do everything in their power to make sure that they can't be hijacked by Schwab and Co. This is something so, we can be absolutely so, sure of. So here is here is part of, and I think this is totally true. You know, the Russians and the Chinese, whatever their control grid is, they want it run by Russians and Chinese as opposed to the city of London. Okay, so so we're debating who the middle management is in the control grid. I think there are people who would like not to have a digital control grid. Yeah, <coughs> yeah. I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I agree with you. If I had a choice, of course. I had all digital control stuff out of the window. Right. Telephones out of the window. I mean, right. telephones to, to make telephone calls go back to where you were Landlines. 30 years ago yeah. when they were wonderful. And, uh, and, and, and but, So there's so, all of these yeah, things we're yeah. going to discuss in part three. Carvel Catherine, Wolfram, it was great thank you very to do much. it again. And, uh, <laughs> notwithstanding our, you know, our... The, the things that we could bet upon and one of us this is, this could is lose. This how we figure it out. Anyway. <laughs> 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 Thanks again. Thank I, you for joining I, us on the Solari Report. I, I,